we have been looking at copyright and patents. The main things I want you to get from those is the difference between the kinds of protection they are, what you can protect with a copyright and what you can protect with a, protect with a patent is very different. And th the main thing you need to worry about is copyright, but depending on if, if you have a fairly complex website that's transacting some business, there's the possibility that someone in the US might have a patent on that. There's less of a chance in Europe that you would be infringing someone's patent if you were just going about your business with a regular website. But of course, if you are infringing a US patent, then that would restrict your ability to transact business with American customers. So there are quite a few fairly straightforward things that may be covered by patents. And there's quite a lot of debate in the US about that at the moment. Now, so two more kinds of protection then for intellectual property. Another thing you may stumble upon when you're producing a website is you may encounter some trademark issues. So a trademark is a sign that a particular business has made a product or is the you know the origin of a service so when you get on an Aer Lingus flight you know it's an Aer Lingus flight because you see the Aer Lingus logo as you go about your business the logo is on the plane inside in the plane there's various things and if another airline was to I mean if Ryanair was to change its colour to green and start using four leaf clovers instead of shamrocks, you know, that would be a, that might be a, a problem. So a trademark tells you who is providing the product or the service. So if you buy a pair of shoes and there's a Nike swoosh along the side, you know they're from Nike. And that may provide you with some degree of confidence or not, depending. But the idea is that Nike has spent a lot of effort to persuade you that you should buy Nike shoes, and that swoosh tells you and everyone around you that that's what you've done. Um, so yeah, you do get some issues where in, in some other countries the trademarks may not be as well enforced. And so if you buy stuff there, you might find even when you arrive back in Europe that your counterfeit goods are confiscated at the border and stuff. That can, that can happen as well. Typically, a trademark is a logo, but it can also be a word or a phrase, or it could even be some sort of a cartoon character. You can't sell paint using a, a big shaggy dog, because that's what Dulux does, the Dulux dog. Sells the, sells the Dulux paint. You can't use a dog if you want to sell paint. Similarly, you probably can't use cute puppies if you're trying to sell toilet paper unless you're Andrex. So it can be a character also. I'm told that one of the airlines has, a, has trademarked the scent that they spray in the cabin before you come on. And that that's a, a trademark of theirs, which means no one else could use that. Some companies may also trademark a, a particular shade of blue, say, for their products and services, whatever. It could even be a sound. Remember a few years ago, Intel had an ad, Intel Inside campaign, and we like, you'd see Intel Inside, and it would go, do do do. I imagine, too, well, I suspect um, the boot up sound that a Mac makes when it starts up <coughs> might be a, a trademark of Apple. Okay, so it tells you where the product or service comes from. Now, to get protection for your trademark, it's a good idea to register it. But you don't have to register it. So I suspect, for example, that CIT isn't a registered trademark of Cork Institute of Technology. But if some grind school downtown started using the term CIT, you know, for Cork intensive training or something, and they were using it in a way that might 
people might confuse it with CIT, then CIT could probably go to court and say, you know, you need to, you need to stop that. But if they registered it as their trademark? If they registered it as their trademark, then that might be a problem for CIT. Generally, what might happen is the when you go to register, they, they check to see what's already registered, obviously. But they probably wouldn't do a check out in the, you know, in the environment, so to speak, to see what's widely in use. Certainly, if you went to, as we'll see in a second, if you went to the patent office in Dublin, as well, she's not in Dublin, if you went to the patent office to trademark CIT, they would probably be aware of Cork Institute of Technology. And so they might prevent it on, on that grounds. Okay. Um, so you don't, you don't need to register your trademark, but it's a good idea because it can afford you some protection in the event of a dispute or some issue. Trademark protection lasts for as long as the trademarks are in use. So I think Arthur Conan Doyle's estate trademarked Sherlock Holmes in the hope that after the copyright expired, they would still have the trademark. But I would say they won't have much luck with that, to be honest. So you apply in, in, in much the same way as a patent in that you would fill out a form and whatnot, but it's a much simpler process. Because really you're just checking that the, the, the trademark isn't already out there. You know, it doesn't, there are not many criteria for it to be a valid trademark, unlike a patent. So, um, and also the process, that the harmonization process for trademarks is, is further along than it is for patents in Europe. So you can get your trademarks throughout the EU at the Office for the Harmonization of the Internal Market, which is in Alicante. You don't have to go to Alicante, obviously. But um, so you would fill out there your application online and then you'd have a trademark then for the EU. I mean, one of the cornerstones of, of the way the EU works is that there's free movement of, of goods throughout the Union. Obviously, if you are making a particular brand of coffee and then you can't sell it in Germany because someone else has a trademark there, that brand, I mean, that makes a mockery then of the whole free movement of goods and things. So it's important that these things uh, are harmonized which is why we have that office. No, so I think if you applied to Alicante with CIT, they would not be aware of Cork Institute technology being a big deal. And so it's possible, for example, you might even get that. There may also be a mechanism by which CIT could oppose that, but I, d I don't think there's anyone in CIT watching out for those things. Um, I had, it's downstairs in my office, I forgot to bring it, some, some interesting ones. So if you go, to, I'll, give, I'll bring it with me actually in the next class, but you can go to the patent office and look at the registration for People's Republic of Cork, for example. So someone has trademarked that for clothing, websites, um, bars, events music events, things like that. They wouldn't have trademarked it, for example, for airlines. So if you wanted to, you know, launch the People's Republic of Cork Air or something, you know, then it's not registered for that. Thank you. So you can register it. You don't have to, but it's probably a good idea. So some well-known and less well-known trademarks. So this baby on board thing is a registered trademark in the US at least anyway, which I thought was strange. So you can't make those things and sell them. This, his master's voice here, the dog looking into the gramophone, recognizing his master's voice on the record. That's uh, the older form of HMV. So you sometimes still see a dog associated with HMV. So, for example, the Virgin Record Store, or whatever, would probably have not been able to use a dog 
in its in its music, you know, and its promotion. I mean, in its advertising or whatever, because that might be considered trying to trade on the back of HMV's reputation, such as it might be. Clearly, one of the most well-known trademarks is Coca-Cola. And that's a very valuable trademark. I mean, if you could make something that tastes better than Coke, probably wouldn't be a whole lot of good to you because you couldn't sell it as, as Coca-Cola. I think most people understand that when they're buying Coke, they're buying for the most part the, the, the brand. From a branding point of view, it's interesting that if you were to go along to the, the county library and look at kids' books from about 150 years ago, you might find that Santa Claus doesn't necessarily look like that. So before Coca-Cola, Santa Claus was often seen wearing green or blue, and sometimes he was young, sometimes he was old, sometimes he was skinny, he wasn't always fat. And the Santa Claus that we have is largely uh, uh, from the imagination of Coca-Cola. And that's why he wears red fit in with the Coca-Cola logo. So, um, yeah, so trademarks. There are issues with websites. If I was to have a domain name, for example, obviously if I was to try and register Coca-Cola.ie and it wasn't already registered, there'd be an issue with that. Even if the registrar here took my registration, Coca-Cola would be very easily able to get it back. If I said something like Coca-Cola recipes.com, parents, people who cook big things with Coke. I'm not sure how it would be there. Would Coke have an issue with that? Certainly, if they didn't like what I was doing, they could maybe take some issue with that. If I was to say, you know, Coca Cola sucks.com, it has been established that that's acceptable. That if you're going to be using someone else's trademark to comment on it, that's, that's acceptable and that they, they can't stop you doing that. Coke, Coke is also Coke is also a trademark of Coca Cola, as is the shape of the bottle, as is the sort of um, white ribbony thing. So uh, yeah, so it, it can it can depend. You also, but you certainly can't go around using people's trademarks on your websites. I've seen uh, these. I, just, I can't remember what they're selling actually, but you say things like you know you'd see the BBC logo and the CNN logo and stuff as if these organizations were, were endorsing it or something. So you do need to be, to be wary, but in the US anyway, at least, it's well established that if you want to comment on a product, you're entitled to use it, use it by name, you know, to, to do that, okay? Trade secrets then are a whole other kind of protection. And in some respects, they're the opposite of patents. So in patents, the state gives you some rights in exchange for disclosure for a fixed time. Patents, I, I think, probably came along as an antidote to trade secrets. So two or three hundred years ago, you would join a guild, you know, the guild of whatever makers and they'd share the secrets with you of how to make this and how to make that and you'd swear not to share them with anyone else that wasn't a member of the guild and what patents do is open up knowledge to to disperse it and spread it far and wide so a trade secret is something that's not generally known to the public and it confers some sort of benefit on its holder and then the holder must take reasonable efforts to maintain the secrecy. So if you had a new way to make beer that only used half as much water as was currently used, you could 
patent that technique and then you would have 20 years to extract some value from that patent. Alternatively, you could just tell nobody and you could get into the beer making business and you might do very well for yourself because you can make it using less water and water is expensive or something. Now if you went bust, your company went bust, of course that those techniques might be might be lost. If you fell under a bus, that that you know fabulous way of making beer might be lost to mankind forever. But from in many situations it's a good idea for you to use a trade secret rather than a patent because the patent is going to be publicized so your competitors are going to straight away see how you do it. Now they won't be allowed to use your technique for 20 years. They might find some way to sort of do something like it that's not covered by your patent in which case you'd be you'd be screwed but also they might be able to depending on what industry you're in might be able to figure out something about your strategy, about where you're going, what, what things you're developing. So you might not want people to know that. So sometimes a secret might be the way to go. If you go back to the beer example, didn't want to get into the beer business yourself, you might go to someone like Heineken and say, I have this technique which I'll share with you and before you would tell them, you'd get them to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which would prevent them then from sharing that with anyone else. So if you need to share your secret with someone just in the course of doing business, you use this NDA, non-disclosure agreement. And that will afford you some protection then. So if they do tell, you know, spill the secret, you might be able to sue them. Also, incidentally, if they do spill the secret and you had been planning on applying for a patent for it, provided if, if they sort of cheated and put it out there without your permission, you might still be able to get the patent, even though it's kind of out there and known. You'll find then in companies, lawyers will be going around making sure everyone's saying, you know, oh, lock your filing cabinet, make sure you lock your filing cabinets at night because that has the secret, whatever, whatever. And, you know, it's sitting on a server as well somewhere. It's probably less protection. But they want to be able to demonstrate in the event of an issue that they took steps to protect the secrecy. So that's why you have the theater of Coca-Cola sending people around the world, the briefcase with the secret ingredient, you know, handcuffed to them as they bring it to the coca-cola factories around the world to you know add that super secret ingredient which is probably not that big a secret but they are demonstrating that they wanted to have the protection of a trade secret and so they're going to these elaborate steps so that if you produce a coca-cola clone then that's a perfect coca-cola clone you can say oh, you stole our secret you can't allow him to make soft drinks in that way because they're using our secret. And look, we took these, you know, huge steps to keep it a secret and they still managed to get it. So, so the most famous trade secrets are recipes. And I have a ha or I had a handout, I think they're all gone now, of a, a case in Ireland involving spice burgers that went to court. There was both a, a trade secret and a trademarks issue because some company went bust and some guy set up making spice burgers and he knew the recipe for the spice burgers but he was being told that that was a trade secret and he shouldn't be using it but also they were claiming that even the whole name spice burger was was a trademark and so that was made for made for an interesting case um, it turns out, though, that the most valuable trade secrets would probably be technology ones. So if you take the Gorilla Glass on an iPhone, for example, the glass that's really, really strong, I imagine much of it is protected by patents, 
but I also imagine that some of it is just protected by secrets. So only Corning, the company that makes the glass, probably knows exactly how they make it. Now you can imagine if you were some Chinese mo phone manufacturer, you would love to know the secret of the Gorilla Glass. And often when you hear of companies, networks being compromised, you know, they're not looking for the plans for the Death Star or anything, or for missile you know, launch codes. They're actually looking for, gosh, how do they make that super hard glass? And how does Apple do this? And how does Boeing do that? What's the design for whatever, whatever? So although big companies would have many patents, they would also have many secrets. And they probably sit down and, and discuss at length which things should, be, should they patent and which things should they try and keep secret. Okay. So protection for trade secrets doesn't, doesn't expire. So you can have a secret as long as you want. If you think about it, if, if, if Microsoft, Microsoft, if Coca-Cola had patented the way to make Coke, that was protection that would have lasted 20 years. Whereas the secret is still a secret. It's still got protection for that. Now, as it turns out, of course, the trademark is what they really have. So depending then on what you're doing, you may want to go for a patent or for a secret. Secrets can be harder to keep and obviously if someone knows that something is possible they might try and figure out a way to do it themselves. So if someone knows you are making beer using less water, they don't know how you're doing it, they don't know your secret, but now they know it's possible, they might go okay that's doable, we must try and figure out how to do that. And they might come up with a way to do the same. If they haven't stolen your secret, if they just figured out for themselves how to do something similar, well, there's nothing you can do there. Whereas if you had a patent, you would have protection against them using it at all. So it will, it will depend. So depending on what you're doing, there are four main kinds of intellectual property and the ways it can be protected. So patents are for new inventions. You apply for a patent, eventually you get your patent and it'll last 20 years. No one else will be able to make it in that time without your permission. Copyright is for creative and artistic works. And you get that from the moment it's in tangible form. Tangible form even includes on your hard disk at this stage. That'll last until 70 years after the author's death in most places. It's a long time. Trademarks are identifiers for the origins of products and services. You get those just by using them, but you can also, if you want, register them, and that's a good idea, depending. And then trade secrets are valuable information not known to the public, and you should need to keep those secret. That's how you keep them secret. You keep them secret. There's another form of patent, which isn't on here, a design patent, which exists in some jurisdictions, and that's a sort of short-term protection for the look and feel of something or the design of something and I didn't put that here because I thought so it was complicate things and, and muddy the waters a bit and of course the all these things may vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction but like I said there are efforts in Europe to harmonize across Europe and beyond a bit and obviously the US is one big huge market because all of these things happen at the, the federal level any questions on any of that? Great stuff. So, so in the next class, we'll continue our look at search engine optimization. We'll go back to that. Okay, and I'll bring some of those handouts that I've left over as well.